Welcome to the HWDSB Elementary Health and Physical Education, Human Development and Sexual Health Education Information Night. My name is Bill Torin, Superintendent of Education for the Program Division here at the HWDSB. Thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I bring greetings on behalf of our the Chair of our Board, Don Danko, and our Director of Education and Executive Council. Our Director is Cheryl Robinson Petrazzini. I also want to acknowledge the work of uh, System Principal for Learning Services, Jennifer Burley and uh, Nick Benner of Corporate Communications for their support uh, with tonight's presentation. They're working behind the scenes uh, to support uh, questions and answer questions uh, provided through chat and have uh, supported the overall development of tonight's session. I will now provide the land acknowledgement. The Hamilton Wentworth District School Board acknowledges our presence on ancestral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee Confederacy land as determined by the District of Winston Treaty. The intent of of this agreement is for all nations sharing in this territory to do so responsibly, respectfully, and sustainably in perpetuity. We respect the long-standing relationship with the local Indigenous communities, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, for those of you who would um, preferred uh, translated captions, we have it in Arabic, Chinese, Urdu, Korean, Hindi, and Punjabi today. Tonight's session has four key components. First of all, I'll provide some background and context on the elementary health and physical education curriculum, specifically focused on the healthy living strand D within that curriculum. Then we'll go um, deeper and learn more about the human development and sexual health learning that uh, is part of that curriculum and we'll take a, a grade by grade uh, review of those key expectations that uh, teachers will instruct we'll also review the exemption process and we'll finish with a question and answer session using our chat function the question and answer is not necessarily live um, it does not provide an opportunity for you to um, speak or interact, but it does uh, have you able to ask questions using our uh, live Q&A chat, and we have educators who will answer that question as quickly as possible. If you do not get an answer or think of a question after this event, uh, please uh, feel free to connect with your child's school um, to address that question. Before we begin formally, I do want to uh, bring two key resources to your attention. One is we have a dedicated uh, human development webpage at um, hwdsb.on.ca uh, slash elementary slash program slash human development. Uh, we do encourage you to um, uh, go to this site if you are looking for additional information. Uh, the site is also translatable in several languages using uh, a Google Translator function. We've also created a parent guide that's available to all of you. Uh, again, it's available at that website, um, but I have also uh, posted the link for those of you who are, are interested in opening it more immediately. Let me begin with a broad overview of the elementary health and physical education curriculum. It was revised in 2019, and uh, this curriculum helps students learn the skills and knowledge they need to lead healthy, active, lives and make healthy and safe choices. The learning in the curriculum relates to everyday experiences of students at home, at school and in the community and helps students develop skills and habits that will enhance their physical, social, emotional and mental well-being for the rest of their lives. The curriculum has several strands, social emotional learning in strand A, uh, active living in strand B, movement competence, skills, concepts and strategy, uh, in strand C and strand D is healthy living and the human development and sexual health themes and learning is part of strand D healthy living. The HD 
HWDSB approach really focuses on acknowledging that parents are the primary educators of their children with respect to the learning world values, appropriate behavior, and cultural, spiritual, and personal beliefs and traditions. And parents are, and families, are children's first role models. It's therefore important for schools and parents to work together to ensure that home and school provide a mutually supportive framework for young people's educations. HWDSB staff will teach the human development and sexual health component of this curriculum to elementary students uh, in May and June of 2023. By then, educators will have developed strong relationships with students and have a clear understanding of their maturity levels. Delivering the content in the spring helps ensure that we teach curriculum in a developmentally and age appropriate manner. Concerns sometimes circulate about what is and isn't taught. The best pace, place to seek clarification and reassurance is from the school. And to help families feel comfortable with what students will learn, we encourage parents, guardians, and caregivers to start with their child's teacher. Those teachers can provide examples of lesson plans developed by uh, OFIA, which is the Ontario uh, Physical Education Association, and outline how the curriculum will be taught. The HWDSB has also provided an overview document that I've just shared that provides a breakdown of what students will learn in each grade about human development and sexual health. Our approach is also rooted in uh, our strong commitment to human rights and equity. Human development and sexual health is more than simply teaching young students about the anatomy and physiology of reproduction. Sexual health is understood in the broadest sense within the curriculum and can include a range of topics and concepts from sexual development, reproductive health, choice and sexual readiness, consent, abstinence and protection, to interpersonal relationships, sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression, affection, love, pleasure, body image, and uh, gender roles and expectations. Sexual development is one component of the overall human development and learning about healthy human development begins at an early age. It's important for the learning to be appropriate to the student's age and stage in development. Younger children will learn the name of body parts and begin to understand how their bodies work and develop skills for healthy relationships, which includes understanding consent and demonstrating respect for others. As students grow and develop, they build an understanding of the physical, emotional, social, and cognitive changes that are happening to them and further uh, develop a sense of self and identity that will they all begin to experience more so at puberty. Their learning about human development and their understanding of its many interrelated aspects deepens as students get older. And as the nature of their relationships change, they learn more about themselves, others, and identity, peers, family, and romantic relationships, personal safety, and decision-making. Acquiring information and skills and developing attitudes, beliefs, and values related to identity and relationships are lifelong processes. The overall and specific expectations in the strand are developmentally appropriate and should be addressed with a sensitivity and respect to the uniqueness of each individual student. Students have the knowledge and skills needed to make sound decisions about matters affecting their physical and mental health and well-being before they experience real-life situations in which decisions have to be made. Depending on the particular group of students in the class or the school, it may be helpful to plan for instruction in groupings, or we might provide instruction in groupings or settings that are most conductive to this learning, including small groups or groups uh, separated by sex and co-educational groupings. It really depends on the classroom context and the school context. Principals and teachers must follow our board's policy that allows for students to be exempted at their family's request from instruction related to human development and sexual, uh, sexual health. I do note though that families requesting uh, an exemption um, are being exempted from the entire strand and not just the human development and sexual health. So um, your child will miss uh, other components of um, healthy living learning that occurs within that strand. I'll now begin to share with you the curriculum expectations by grade, starting with grade one. In grade one, the curriculum expectations include uh, identifying body parts, including genitalia, using the correct terminology and body positive language. 
students will um, be expected to identify their five senses and describe how each functions. They'll also be demonstrating understanding of and apply proper hygiene procedures for protecting their own health and protecting transmission of disease to others. Uh, this will all be done, as I noted, uh, in an age and developmentally appropriate way. Uh, so while, yes, we are identifying uh, body parts as part of the learning, uh, using correct uh, terminology and body positive language, uh, any, any images that are used, uh, for instance, will be absolutely um, uh, developmentally appropriate for grade one students. Grade two moves on to have our students uh, begin to understand the basic stages of human development and the related changes that will start to their bodies. Also to identify physical, mental, social, and environmental factors that are important for healthy growth and living throughout life. Students will begin to uh, be able to demonstrate the ability to identify and appreciate aspects of how their bodies work and describe what they can do to ensure they will continue to appreciate their bodies as they grow and change. Students will also demonstrate an understanding of and apply practices that continue to contribute to the maintenance of good oral health, such as brushing, flossing, going to the dentist. In grade four, the learning starts to include uh, identifying the characteristics of healthy relationships and describing ways uh, for of responding to bullying and other challenges and and of communicating consent with their uh, interactions with others. Students will learn to identify factors that affect their physical development, their social emotional development, and uh, the development of a healthy body image. Students will also learn to describe how visible differences and invisible differences make people, each person unique, and identify ways of showing respect for differences in others. Grade four, students will begin to uh, describe the physical changes that are occurring at puberty and the emotional and social impacts that may result from those changes. They'll also be able to, uh, by the end of the learning, demonstrate an understanding of their personal care needs and the application of personal hygienic practices associated with the onset of puberty. In grade five, students will learn to identify the parts of the reproductive system and describe how the body changes during puberty. Students will be able to describe the processes of menstruation and spermatogenesis and explain how these processes relate to reproduction and overall development. They'll be able to identify intersecting factors that affect the development of a personal person's self-concept, including their sexual orientation and how these factors can support their personal health and well-being. Students will also begin to be able to describe emotional and interpersonal stresses related to puberty, recognize signs that could indicate mental health concerns, and identify strategies that they can apply to manage stress, build resilience, keep open communication with family members and caring adults, and to enhance their mental and emotional well-being. In grade six, students will begin to demonstrate an understanding of the impacts of viewing sexual explicit media, including pornography, describe how they can build confidence and lay a foundation for healthy relationships by acquiring a clear understanding of their physical, social, and emotional changes that occur during adolescence. They'll make begin to make informed decisions that demonstrate a respect for themselves and others and an understanding of the concept of consent to help build healthier relationships using a variety of social emotional learning skills. They'll also assess the effects of stereotypes and assumptions regarding gender roles and expectations, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, culture, mental health, and the abilities on an individual self-concept, self social inclusion, and relationships with others, and propose appropriate ways to re uh, of responding to and changing harmful assumptions and stereotypes that can lead to destructive social attitudes, including homophobia and racism. In grades seven, students will all begin to learn how to explain the importance of having a shared understanding with a partner of the following, delaying sexual activity until they're older, the reasons for not engaging in sexual activity, the concept of consent, 
the legal age of consent and how consent is communicated. And in general, the need to communicate clearly with each other when making decisions about sexual activity in a healthy, loving relationship. Students will begin to identify sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections and describe their symptoms, identify ways of preventing sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections and or unplanned pregnancy, such as delaying first intercourse and other sexual activities until a person is older and using condoms and other forms of protect protection consistently. Demonstrate an understanding of the physical, emotional, social, and cognitive factors that need to be considered when making decisions related to sexual health. Explain how relationships with others and sexual health may be affected by the physical and emotional changes associated with puberty. In grade eight, students will identify and explain factors that can affect an individual's decision about sexual activity and identity, sources of support, including sexual health. They'll demonstrate an understanding of gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, and identify factors that help individuals of all identities and orientations develop a positive self-concept. They'll demonstrate an understanding of abstinence, contraception, and the use of effective and suitable protection to prevent pregnancy and sexually transmitted bloodborne infections, and the concept of consent, as well as the skills they need to apply in order to make safe and healthy decisions about sexual activity. Students will also analyze the attractions and benefits associated with being in a healthy relationship, as well as the benefits, risks, and drawbacks for themselves and others of relationships involving different degrees of sexual intimacy. I'll now move to discuss the exemption process. Exemptions will be granted for instruction related to all health development human development and sexual health expectation in a student's grade. There'll be no academic penalty for an exemption. There'll be no assessment, evaluation, or reporting of exempted students' achievement in that strand uh, for that grade. And an exemption form will need to be completed if parents and guardians want their children exempted from this learning. The form is available and can be accessed through the parent portal. Paper copies and or form calls to school will also be accepted if parent portal is not an option for a family. So uh, in um, listening to our presentation up to this point and um, having questions and concerns um, that you feel you need addressed uh, to feel comfortable with your, your children uh, engaging in some of this learning, I do strongly encourage families to of course uh, start with the child's classroom teacher, a letter will come home regarding uh, the learning that will occur uh, over the course of uh, uh, the next uh, two months and uh, when that will happen as well. Uh, we, um, if you still have uh, continuing concerns, um, please feel free to uh, then move to a conversation with the principal or vice principal of the school. Um, but ultimately, uh, as families and parents, you have a choice to exempt your child from um, all uh, of the learning uh, within this um, within this strand that would occur during May and June. And uh, the school will, there's a variety of different ways that uh, schools will uh, organize that exemption in terms of uh, where your children um, will continue their learning on, on a different subject matter. We're now going to move into the uh, question and answer time. Uh, so again, a, a quick reminder that we do use our text box feature. Um, that we have a team that will uh, answer questions um, if we can, or we'll ask you to, as I've mentioned, uh, connect with uh, the children's uh, teacher uh, or school uh, broadly if there are uh, questions that we I uh, can't provide an answer to. I'd just like to thank everyone for their time in listening to our presentation. We will uh, take a few minutes to allow you to put questions uh, into our, our chat function. I, I'm sure there are some questions. And then we'll start to uh, both answer them live uh, with the chat function, but I'm also going to take some common questions and 
uh, return and then speak to them uh, uh, live. So we're going to continue until uh, 7.30 is, is uh, our stopping time uh, or until the, uh, we've addressed all the questions of the individuals who are here. Thank you again for, for coming out this evening and, and participating with us and we look forward to, to answering, uh, answering these questions. So I'm seeing a few questions. We're going to um, take a few minutes to uh, begin to answer a few. And I see one question we have is, are there discussions regarding gender in grade one? And, and um, again, I, I'll start by encouraging everyone to take the time to, um, of course, explore the curriculum document and, and the parent guide we've provided. Um, so learning about uh, um, gender uh, formally is not a curriculum expectation in grade one. Uh, you know, discussions around um, gender, gender identity, formally in the curriculum, um, do not begin until students are older, uh, and um, uh, and um, just to be more precise around that, uh, you'll see that uh, in the curriculum that. Um, we start to have conversations around that, uh, including grade six. I'm seeing a question around if if um, a child's in a combined class. Um, really good question. Um, will they um, remain in that class during the educational section uh, sessions, uh, and would they be then? learning material that's a year ahead. This is an excellent question, the type of question uh, that is best asked of the classroom teacher. And I say that because uh, while we can present broadly what's in the curriculum, um, the, the school level context uh, is not something where I can uh, guarantee my answer would necessarily uh, occur at the school level. So please, um, uh, do speak to uh, your child's classroom teacher uh, if you have a question about what what the learning specifically looks like in the uh, in their class, including what resources um, or, or materials would be used to to do the teaching. We do provide access to materials uh, for all teachers from the Ontario uh, Physical Health uh, <clears throat> uh, Health and Physical Education Association (OFIA). Uh, for use by um, by educators, uh, but as parents and families, uh, please do ask those questions. And similarly, the question around uh, the teacher uh, for first grade students or grade one students. Again, um, this might be the homeroom teacher uh, of the class, or it might be uh, uh, a different teacher if perhaps the class has a different teacher for health and physical education. So that's another great question to ask um, about um, at the school level. The letter that comes home will probably indicate who is doing the teaching uh, of the specific material, be it in grade one, be it in grade eight. Uh, but uh, uh, please do ask, please do ask that question. I'm just scrolling through for some common questions or questions that uh, um, haven't been um, uh, attached, and I do want to. I do want to um, uh, just reiterate the. Um, there's a question around why can I uh, not only exempt my child from the sexual part only? I agree with some of these topics, but not all. And and I really um, I empathize with with that question and. Uh, it is the direction uh, through a policy memorandum from the Ministry of Education that um, that an exemption uh, needs to um, be applied to all of the learning and not just uh, a given topic or two topics within uh, your child's uh, curriculum for that age uh, and grade. So um, we don't have flexibility there. That's a direction from the Ministry of Education that uh, we're required to follow. I'm going to step away and make sure I can provide a precise answer for a few of these questions, but I will for I'll just reiterate. Um, uh, please do um, explore the curriculum document or speak to your child's teacher. Um, if you have specific questions 
um, around the curriculum for a given grade and what the learning looks like. I will return in about two minutes. And thank you for the, the ongoing questions. There's, there are, um, there are um, quite a few questions, and I, I did want to to um, start to talk about a little bit. Uh, there's a question that prompts kind of a wider discussion around sexual activity, and and that's where you know where first would sexual intercourse be, in what grade would that be discussed, and it it would arise first in grade in grade five in the context of um, that those curriculum expectations, which are really um, talking about the reproductive system, how the body starts to change uh, during puberty, processes of menstruation and uh, spermatogenesis, and how these relate to reproduction and overall uh, development. So uh, when we look at that learning, that's where within a context of a, a relationship, uh, we're always talking, uh, we start to really talk about um, that sexual intercourse leads to uh, reproduction. Uh, in terms of a wider, you know, as we move from grade five through grade eight, a lot of the curriculum starts to then build uh, talking about sexual activity, uh, talking about and always framed through abstinence, um, uh, always framed through delaying sexual activity uh, until um, you feel you are uh, mature or ready to do so. Um, and certainly always uh, with consent of a partner. Uh, these are big ideas that thread through uh, sexual activity within the curriculum. And the curriculum um, assumes uh, as early as grade three, when we talk about visible and invisible differences, um, always assumes that um, we are talking about um, uh, individuals of, of different sexual orientations. So um, is there specific learning in terms of um, perhaps homosexuality? Uh, no, there's not. It's sexual activity is always uh, through a human rights lens framed through uh, the assumption that our students are, could be of uh, any uh, sexual orientation and the learning around consent, around um, uh, uh, Bloodborne and are um, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections um, always are uh, framed through that l larger audience and that larger understanding of of who's in the classroom. And uh, I I see some great questions again about um, you know when will um, when will I know how it's being taught or how will I know it, how the material is being taught in the classroom? And again, um, connecting with the school is, is vital here. Um, it's the classroom teacher who is, is using this curriculum to provide the learning um, with access with, from materials that we've provided uh, centrally. Uh, there is, um, if you have questions in terms of the lesson plan, or uh, the materials being used, again, the classroom teacher can uh, absolutely uh, uh, answer those questions and please feel free to um, have that conversation with them. So I'm gonna step away and again, take a look at the uh, chat area and prepare um, another response for some uh, general or common. Thanks for your patience. I'm just back to take on two questions. One, there was a, a good question around who does the teaching and uh, what are their qualifications? Uh, so um, the, the teacher, HWDSB teacher assigned to your child's, um, your class, either as their homeroom teacher or their health and physical education teacher, um, will be teaching, uh, teaching these materials. Again, if you're concerned about um, being more precise on that, Again, calling the school and contacting the school um, uh, would be my suggestion. Um, they would be, uh, of course, qualified teachers. A health and physical education teacher uh, will have that as a qualification, and, and they've um, uh, obtained that and have a background in, in those materials. In the younger grades, you'll sometimes see that we'll have their uh, homeroom teacher uh, providing the learning, um, again, with possibly with the support of the health and physical education teacher. 
question, uh, second question that I wanted to um, uh, help with again is around, you know, what what is the student who is exempted? What are they doing? Um, and certainly we want to continue their learning. Um, it might be in a different subject area. So there might be um, uh, some assignments or some learning activities. They might join another class uh, for part of the learning. In some school communities where you'd have a large number of students uh, perhaps exempted, um, that, group of, that group of students will continue uh, other learning, say math, uh, mathematics learning, for instance, um, or do more of the physical education side of health and physical education, do continue some learning there uh, while uh, the rest of the students are uh, doing some of the human development and sexual health learning. Uh, again, uh, this is often a class by class or uh, school by school uh, context for this, uh, for what happens within an exemption. So again, it's a good it's a good question as you make and if you do make an exemption request, um, then you'll be made aware of um, how your children will continue learning. Of course, it's it's well within your purview also to um, perhaps if it's at the end of the day, um, a, a parent and the family can always uh, dismiss their child early if that makes you the most comfortable. So I'm going to go back again to take a look at a few of the questions and return in just a few minutes. Well, again, just coming back, um, just to uh, reiterate, because I think it, I think it's important to do so that um, um, we appreciate there might be uh, some elements of of the curriculum that you're not comfortable with, but want your child to partic uh, participate in the wider health and phys ed curriculum. So, um, as a reminder, an exemption. Uh, is for all of the learning in, in the human development and sexual health strand, but um, for physical activities, so the classic gym class, um, your child is not exempted from that. They participate fully in that. Um, what, what we're not able to do by the direction of the ministry is, is to um, uh, have, um, have a situation where um, certainly that uh, there's some choosing between uh, what elements of strand D, the healthy living, um, is, is being, um, a child's being exempted from. Um, some really good questions about how long will the learning be and when will it occur. Uh, so um, a letter will come home with the dates uh, through which the, the learning will occur, um, possibly even the periods. Um, some schools are more precise than others. Uh, to per, um, to provide parents an awareness of when when the learning can occur. Child can be exempted at any time. So if you're not uh, comfortable after uh, perhaps a first day of learning and there's an additional day or two, um, and by day I mean a period or two, uh, to continue, uh, then um, please free, feel free to do so. As a reminder, a phone call to the school or an email uh, or a written note is is more than sufficient, um, uh, for sure. Um, so I just wanted to be clear that letter um, again, which is a requirement in the Ministry of Education and is a long-standing practice um, of the board, will come home um, to give you the the precise uh, dates of the of the learning. Um, some really good questions around maturity levels. And um, if there's questions that are being asked that um, perhaps is at a different maturity level than than your um, than your child, um, it's a really great question. And and uh, I, I ask you as parents to trust that our educators um, uh, really have a strong sense uh, and use their professional judgment in terms of questions that. Um, they feel a class is ready for and then questions that uh, perhaps need to be addressed um, in a different way with with a given student um, and they will make they'll make those choices in the moment um, of the classroom that's one of the key reasons why we delay this learning until um, may and june we really want um, educators to know their class to know their students quite well to um, uh, understand um, through that time, you know, by May, uh, the class has been together for eight months of school. 
Um, so uh, please um, uh, absolutely, um, uh, pardon me, please absolutely trust that uh, educators have a really good sense of um, who's in their class and then we'll make those choices. Uh, certainly um, topics may or questions may be raised um, that are outside of the curriculum. And again, um, those will be uh, the expectation is those are handled in a in a, a developmentally in a grade and age appropriate manner. Um, and certainly going beyond the curriculum is is uh, not the expectation we have for for our educators. Um, but certainly sometimes questions are are in the classroom and and um, and will be answered in the best ways possible. Uh, typically, what we'll find in in some situations is families will be uh, perhaps involved in in um, having a conversation around a question or helping uh, to provide an answer um, to a question um, to make sure they're aware. It's really, again, on a case by case basis, but but generally uh, generally speaking, our educators know their classes. They know the maturity level of their students and and who their students are and. And we'll handle these. Um, we'll handle these uh, situations uh, with great sensitivity. And so we haven't received or very few new questions, but I do want to just take on a number of questions around um, gender identity, uh, gender ideology. So um, I just want to reaffirm the HWDSB's commitment to uh, human rights as enshrined in the Ontario Human Rights Code uh, and our our human rights policy and. And that um, both the Human Rights Code and our policy uh, very much uh, speaks to the equal treatment and the treatment without disc uh, discrimination of all individuals, uh, including uh, uh, students' right and families' right to gender I, um, <clears throat> to uh, their gender expression. Uh, so in terms of the, the context of the learning uh, in, uh, the healthy living strand. Uh, what that means is all of our students uh, need to feel uh, safe, supported, and included in the learning. Uh, and the learning, the expectation of educators is for that learning to be delivered in such a way that uh, everyone can, uh, in a sense, see themselves in the learning, uh, feel safe and supported as part of the learning. Um, and again, the exemption process is designed uh, for families who are um, uh, concerned about, and we've spoken earlier about uh, our approach with families being, you know, the primary educators initially of their uh, of their of their children, obviously, um, uh, families to make decisions about if they're comfortable with the topics that are being taught, um, and, or would they prefer to uh, lead some of that learning themselves at home. So um, that is a, a process that we've developed uh, through ministry direction to support to support all families and to make sure that everyone feels um, again safe uh, included and accepted so with just a sorry with just a few minutes left uh, i do um uh, really appreciate it a your time tonight and coming out to to hear us we we really appreciate it uh, and uh, the excellent questions that were asked um, I'll just reiterate a few key uh, key points. One is we do have a dedicated website and a parent guide available on our main website, and uh, it's also been uh, placed in the in the chat. I do greatly encourage you if you do have questions uh, and want some more details around the curriculum uh, to uh, to please explore those um, explore those resources. Uh, I also uh, just want to reiterate that. Um, um, speaking to your child's teacher and the principal, uh, if you do have questions, is is always recommended. So there's clarity. You'll re you'll receive a letter from them that will uh, speak to that. Some schools will even uh, host a smaller or some classes at times. We'll will host a, a, an information session. Some it's not mandatory, but it, it may happen in your child's school. So please uh, do feel free to do that. Um, um we um uh, the exemption process is um without academic policy there's uh, your child's mark will not be impacted in any way or uh 
if you do choose to uh, make an exemption, but an exemption is for all of the learning uh, around human development and sexual health. Uh, so please, if you do that, um, uh, if you do that, then um, be aware that yes, your child can continue in health and physical education broadly, but uh, you'll be exempted from all of that learning. And um, I will also just um, uh, really uh, encourage families to uh, take the time, uh, consider what is uh, best for um, your child, um, as you know your child best. Uh, and uh, I wish you best of luck. Again, uh, I will now just step away. If there's additional questions, we will um, please do put them in the chat. We'll endeavor to uh, answer them if we can. But um, you know, in terms of that classroom experience that your child will receive, um, the school is is the best uh, at uh, answering that question rather than our ability to do so speaking for uh, almost 90 different elementary schools. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, and your patience as we answer questions and I wish you all a good night.